And there we are. Okay, look at that. Um, uh, first question is uh, no, but you asked it verbally already. Um, uh, Wanda Costa, please give an overview about the use cases of the different types of RCUs. And what's the difference between RCU and SRCU, which certainly fits in there. And which user space has the inflation I recommend? All right, okay. you got some good ones here. All right, good. So I'll start, I'll take them in order. Um, the uh, different RCUs, I mean, if you'd have told me 25 years ago that there would be more than one flavor of RCU, uh, I'm not sure what I would have said, but I know I would not have believed you. I, I wouldn't have seen the need for more than one. So uh, let's go through in time order, I guess. Um, let's see here. Um, um, anyway, I guess I'll just, uh, I, I, what I'll do is I'll type into the matrix chat as I'm talking. And that way, uh, that way there's a record of what I've said. Oh, we got a whiteboard now. Cool. Uh, thank you. And can I do text and type at this thing somehow? Is that an option? I can do tools and I can do text. All right, look at that. So we'll go over here. So uh, initially we just had RCU. Uh, as in, uh, I guess I'll do the read side things, RC read lock. And at that time, it was strictly uh, non-preemptible. In fact, when the first preemptible kernel started appearing in the early 2000s, what RC read lock did, and, and recently does again, is do preempt disable. And so the, the thing was, is that if you saw a CPU context switch, you knew that any previous readers that CPU might have had going have ended. And that was that was the way it was. Uh, then what happened was that a couple of guys in uh, in uh, uh, Norway, I think it was, uh, and I'm gonna I'll remember their names at 3 a.m. tomorrow. Sorry, uh, they they came up with a scenario where you could have networking traffic so viciously uh, intense that a uh, given CPU never got out of soft IRQ which meant that it never scheduled, which meant that RCU never saw a grace period end. Uh, and that was, uh, so what happened was that we had RCU read BH, uh, the BH flavor of RCU. Now the idea there is that this version of RCU disables soft IRQ across the read side critical section. And so any point in execution where soft IRQs are enabled, you know, where you aren't in a local BH disable or you're not in a soft IRQ server, interrupts are enabled and so on, is a quiescent state. And that meant that even with a maximal networking load where you never got out of KSoft IRQD, uh, it could still have quiescent states. And so there's some parts of networking that use that, again, for denial of service attack loads. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the early preemptible uh, kernels just had RC read lock disabled preemption, and that was fine. Uh, if you want a few milliseconds of response time, it's great. But then uh, the dash uh, RT project started around 2004, 2005, and those guys were looking for deep sub millisecond uh, response times. And at that point, disabling RCU across a task list walk just you know, that, that killed you right there. So uh, we needed to have preemptible RCU. I spent many months, many very depressing months, not finding solutions. Uh, uh, eventually, Esben Nielsen made a suggestion that didn't work, but uh, or it didn't work in general. It, it worked kind of in specific. Uh, situations. And uh, I was able to take and run with that uh, and make the first version of of, uh, of uh, preemptible RCU. But then you still needed non-preemptible RCU because by that time people were using synchronized RCU or synchronized kernel, it was called earlier, to wait for interrupt handlers. Uh, so uh, what ended up happening is we ended up with RCU read lock sched. Uh, which could just be preempt disable or IRQ disable or whatever, local IRQ disable or whatever. Um, and so we had those three at that point uh, for those different workloads. Uh, and up to about 2006, anytime anybody said, hey, you know, I really need to block in an RC read side critical section, that was a sign to me that they really didn't understand RCU and I needed to explain it to them. Again, until 2006, when some people came up with a real use case that really made sense. Fortunately, I'd already done preemptible RCU, and so at that point, I could uh, see a way to make it work. Had they, had they 
giving that use case before preemptive RCU, I probably said, sorry, can't help you. But uh, that is where SRCU came from. Um, now, uh, one question is, well, wait a minute, you got preemptive RCU, you got SRCU, what's the difference? And the difference is that preemptive RCU allows only preemption, okay? Um, I mean, okay, if you acquire a, uh, a, a dash RT spin lock, non raw spin lock, which can sleep, uh, that counts as preemption in a strange way. It's a special case because in those cases, uh, there's priority boosting. So that means that uh, somebody uh, isn't running and the priority boosting will get them running. So it's kind of an indirect preemption, if you will. All right. Uh, all right, so SRCU, on the other hand, allows general sleeping, just sleeping any way you want. You want to wait for a network packet and wake up when the network packet arrives? Great, go for it. Might be a while, but that's your problem. And the problem is, now these the first three were global, still are. Uh, in other words, if anybody anywhere does RC read lock, then any synchronized SRC, excuse me, any synchronized RCU anywhere will wait for all of those RC read locks to find their matching outermost RC read unlock. Uh, that fails miserably with SRCU because if you got somebody that has a little algorithm and they're waiting for a network packet, they're gonna have really, really, really long grace periods. I mean, by design. And if you got somebody else that only wants to wait for disk to complete, disk transfers to complete, uh, they're not gonna be happy waiting for a network transfer that they don't care about. As a result, SRCU has domains. Uh, each, you, you create, an, create an initialize an SRCU struct or declare it statically. And each SRCU struct is its own thing, all right? Uh, and uh, so what happens uh, is that each of them, the readers for a given SRCU struct will delay the synchronized SRCUs for that SRCU struct and for no other one. So that's how we get away with having indefinite blocking by allowing uh, these to be gathered up into smaller chunks so that uh, somebody with long grace periods isn't inconveniencing somebody else that wants relatively short grace periods. Okay. Uh, and you could ask, I suppose, why not have domains or something for the normal RCU? And the reason is, uh, if you have a situation where, where you can do it globally, that's much more efficient. With normal RCU, if you have a whole pile of synchronized SR, excuse me, synchronized RCUs showing up at once, you can do one grace period, a single grace period calculation and satisfy them all. And that means the overhead of that grace period calculation gets amortized over all of those synchronized RCUs. And this is not subtle. Uh, it is really, really easy uh, with a modest machine to end up with, with thousands of update requests, either call RCU or synchronized RCU or, or uh, synchronized RCU expedited uh, for thousands of them to be satisfied with a single grace period computation which amortizes the overhead of the grace period computation down to really close to zero and really helps the efficiency. Okay, so we got four of them so far. Uh, the next one, um, oh, this isn't very helpful. I wonder if I can make this a different size. Well, I'm not gonna worry about it. I'll just start another box. So there. Okay. Uh, and the next one, I, I, I messed up by having having readers. What I'll do is I'll put, I'll put uh, what will I put? Voluntary schedule, I guess. In other words, you you weren't preempted; you scheduled, and that is uh, though that is a quiescence data delimits the reader in both cases. This was something that Stephen Ross had asked for, and it's used for tracing. Uh, they have trampolines. And uh, the trampolines can, uh, uh, they can uh, be preempted, but they aren't supposed to have anything inside of them or anything they call that could voluntarily schedule, okay? Uh, and so what happens is they, when they want to get rid of a trampoline because somebody removed a trace point, they update the binary so it no longer calls the trampoline they wait for a uh, synchronized RCU tasks to complete, or they use call RCU task, whichever. 
Uh, then at that point, they know that all execution that might have been in that trampoline are going to return to that trampoline sometime in the future is complete. Um, and then the grace period ends. Uh, these can have long grace periods, um, uh, you know, seconds. Uh, there's been some work to make them shorter by default in the normal case, but um, they can take a while and that's supposed to be okay. All right. Um, then uh, uh, the BPF, next one was for the BPF guys. They needed to be able to uh, attach helpers to both ends of a function that sleeps. A very few of them, that they're whitelisted. They have just a few that can do that. And uh, uh, RCU tasks didn't work for them, the voluntary schedule as aspect. Uh, and none of the other ones, SRCU would work sort of, but the overhead was excessive. Uh, BPF needs to be able to place itself in really, really high uh, performance pieces of the kernel on fast paths. And the extra pair of memory barriers that SRCU has just meant it was out of the running. So we ended up with something that's kind of sort of like SRCU, but doesn't have the memory barriers. And that is uh, RC read lock tasks. That, that's quite recent. That was put in in uh, 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 last year, actually. There was a another piece of the, you see, the problem with the voluntary schedule of tasks is it doesn't catch idle tasks. And so what the, uh, and so what ended up happening in tracing is they had interesting combinations of SRCU and the RCU task voluntary schedule trick. And they also would go and just IPI all the C, or excuse me, they would also do, go and force a schedule on all the CPUs. Um, and so they, they ended, that ended up, that, ended up being open coded in several places, the thing saying, okay, run a task on each CPU. Um, and this isn't like run the task on each CPU in turn. It's like for each CPU, wake up a task. And then when each of those tasks is run, wake me up. And that is, uh, uh, so that ends up being a preemption, I guess, uh, schedule anyway, however you schedule. And this is uh, RCU, RCU task rude. Uh, rude because it, messes with all the CPUs, idle or not. Uh, there are also some ad ho other ad hoc uses of RCU. You can uh, make use of uh, work queues in an RCU-like fashion. There's a few places that do that. Um, and I'm probably forgetting something, but these are the, oh, there's also a trivial RCU that's only an RCU torture, but I don't really count that because it's just there to, to verify my slides, not to verify anything that anybody uses in the kernel. All right, so uh, those are the, those are seven. Uh, there's probably some other things that act like R RCU, but that's a start. Um, so uh, Vonder or Wander, I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. Uh, does that cover it, or is there is, was there something specific you were looking for that I missed? Okay, great. Um, uh, glad that was helpful. Um, and then uh, 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 go. Go uh, Ren, whose name I just mangled. Uh, does does that uh, did that explain the SRCU RCU difference, or would you like me to dig more deeply into that? If you want me to dig more deeply, uh, uh, a more specific question would be helpful. Uh, while that's uh, while we're doing that, I'll go ahead to Nur Hussain's question about uh, which. Uh, great. Okay. Thank you. Glad it helped. Uh, about which uh, user space RCU implementation to recommend. Uh, it depends. There's actually a lot of them by now. Uh, there is the one that Matthew and I, uh, and Matthew's the main maintainer of it in uh, user space RCU, and that one's good and sufficient. Uh, it could use some help. Uh, there's some things on my list to do to it for quite some time, uh, mostly involving automatic uh, update size scalability and performance, but it works and there's a fair number of projects to use it, and it's been very heavily tested. Uh, there's also one in the in Facebook's Folly library that seems to work fine. Uh, it's C plus plus rather than C. There's um, concurrency toolkit, I believe, is the name of it. There's a couple of other toolkits that have uh, variants of RCU. They often call them EBR or Epoch based reclamation, which is a particular implementation of of RCU. You have to be a little careful with EBR. The original paper uh, presenting EBR as part of uh, software transactional memory had a bug. Uh, where uh, it could get in trouble with preemption at the wrong place. But 
uh, the ones I've looked at have fixed that bug, so they should be fine too. So uh, the first question is what language are you using? If you're using a garbage collected language, you have RC already in the garbage collector. You're set, no problem. Um, if you're using C, uh, probably the uh, Matthew Daniel's user space library is probably the best thing for you. Uh, uh, and that's in most distros in any case as well. If you're using C++, uh, the Folly library, and there's a few other ones that are C++, I don't, but I don't have a really good um, way of uh, telling you which one you should, which you do. And, uh, oh, uh, so I have to do something. It, okay, so somebody told me that I'm, they're not seeing the updates. Apparently I have to click somewhere else to make the typing appear. Did that help, Claudio? Uh, if not, let me know. Sorry. Uh, I guess the, the trick is to type each one and then do another text window and type the next one. Okay, great. Um, all right. So uh, that's what I can tell you. Uh, actually, what would be really cool is if somebody would go try them all and actually write something up. I'm, I'm probably not going to get to that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, it's something that I would, uh, in the perfect world, I would do, but um, there's only one of me and uh, there's a lot of demands of my time. So it'd be really cool if somebody would just go find them all, uh, test them on various things and, you know, give an overview of what does, which does which and which is worse better in which situation. Uh, different situations, obviously different languages I've mentioned. Uh, there are also different trade-offs between uh, scalability, uh, whether you care more about readers or about updaters, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, uh, Yun Levy, uh, would you please share experiences about debugging memory barrier problems with ARCU? Oof, uh, there'd be a lot of those. Um, what I tend to do is be very conservative. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna use heavier memory barriers and then weaken them carefully. And I'm gonna use uh, uh, things like Linux kernel memory model uh, for design to try to see if I've got something reasonable. For example, um, I recently, it turned out it wasn't something that, it, it turned out it didn't actually make things faster. Uh, there's, RCU has hooks in the idle entry and exit code. And what those do is they increment a counter, uh, they increment going in, they increment coming out, and that, that allows RCU to easily determine if some other CPU is idle. That's important. Because if you have an embedded processor, especially if you have a battery powered embedded processor, it's considered extremely impolite to wake a CPU up unless you seriously have something that it needs to do. And it needs to do, not some other CPU that's already awake, can't do. And so um, doing some, how are you doing something saying, hey, CPU five, um, are you going to quest the state? The CPU getting woken up, powered up and burning a bunch of power and then saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not doing anything. And then going away is, uh, uh, not a good thing. Uh, you can burn a surprisingly large fraction of the battery doing that sort of thing. Uh, and in fact, in the early 2000s, uh, I was working on, I, I had the one of the early prototypes of Dynetic Idle uh, implementation RCU. And it, what it would do is it would kind of run through the rest of the state machine. So it would invoke all the callbacks in that CPU and then let the CPU go completely idle, shut down the schedule clock interrupt. So what would happen, a CPU would go idle, it'd be a few more scheduling clock interrupts, and then it'd be fully idle. So, you know, what's the problem, right? Well, um, the people that were inconvenienced by that, uh, flaming me on Linux kernel mailing list was not sufficient. They called me on the phone and they yelled at me. I'm, I kid you not. I, the phone rang, I picked it up, and there were people screaming at me for these extra scheduling clock interrupts. It turned out that those were worth 30 or 40 percent of their battery lifetime. And getting rid of those uh, helped them out quite a bit. Uh, so, uh, of course, idle entry and exit is important. And we were asking about memory barriers. And the thing is, is that you have to sample this counter off CPU. I mean, the whole point is that the CPU goes idle and RCU doesn't make it do anything. And so that means some other CPU has to safely be able to sense that CPU state, keeping in mind the CPU could wake up at any time. It could get an interrupt. It could get a wake up, uh, anything could happen. A timer might go off. Um, and that means that you can't just kind of guess, it has to be very carefully synchronized. Um, and uh, so uh, weakening those memory barriers, right? Initially, it, it was just an atomic increment. Uh, it has been for a long time because there was a feature that uh, 
the MMA guys thought they needed, but turned out they didn't. And so there were some extra bits and some potential uh, updates. But it turned out they weren't using that, and they weren't. And so I and so Joel Fernandez and a patch to remove it. I eventually applied that, and at that point, it's updated only by its own CPU. And at that point, you don't need an atomic increment. You can just increment it, uh, but you need full memory barriers. And, and uh, so I used the Linux kernel memory model to prove that I only needed a memory barrier on one side and not the other. I could use a store release and a load acquire to get the ordering in the other direction. Uh, Frederick Weisbecker believes that I can get rid of one of the remaining uh, memory barriers, and he might be right, but he's going to have to prove it to me. Uh, but the problem was, so so what happened is you have a non-atomic increment and a full memory barrier, that's BMB. The problem was that a uh, full memory barrier on x86 is, guess what? It's an atomic increment. And that meant that by making it more efficient, I was actually making it less efficient on x86. Uh, Linus noted that and says, you know, I'm not taking that patch. Uh, we were still able to uh, get some reduction in overhead on the read side. So we got something anyway. Uh, but uh, it's an open question whether I can make that more aggressive, uh, uh, reduce it. So uh, to tie that back around, uh, the what I try to do is avoid debugging. I try really, really hard to avoid debugging memory barrier problems. And the way I do that is I use stronger memory barriers unless I can absolutely prove I use weaker ones. And I do the initial debugging with the stronger ones and uh, uh, weaken them very carefully afterwards. The reason for that is it's really easy to make a design where you have a weaker memory barrier. And then later on in the middle of debugging, realize your design wasn't quite right. So you adjust your design and do something really simple that means, hey, wait, no, I need stronger memory barriers there and not realize it, okay? So it's better to get the thing working and then weaken than to try to weaken to start with, unless you've got something that's so straightforward that you just use, for example, store release and load acquire and know you're good. So that's one example, um, uh, maybe not quite what you're looking for, but, uh, but that is my advice. If you're doing code that is lockless, use the strong synchronization first and weaken it carefully. And the reason is you do not want to be debugging uh, ordering and your algorithm at the same time. So debug your algorithm thoroughly and then do the ordering. It's good. Now, don't get me wrong. You want to think about the ordering ahead of time. Because if you wait until afterwards to think about the ordering, you've probably designed yourself out of the weaker models. But uh, be careful. Um, you know, stick with the full memory barrier and, and perhaps and uh, load acquire and store release in, in ca cases where they work straightforwardly, okay, where you're just communicating from one to another. That's my advice. Uh, there's probably better ways to do it, but uh, you know we've all got something to learn, right? So Dimitri asks, uh, do you have any ideas how RCU can be improved during extended, or any future work ideas for RCU? Actually, I've got a list that's kind of long. Um, there's a fair number of things involving uh, RCU torture, for example. Uh, in fact, there was a suggestion yesterday that I have some way of overcommitting CPUs to. Uh, more aggressively turn out bugs. That might be a good idea, might not, but you know, it's worth thinking about. I should add it to the list. Uh, there are any number of uh, uh, things. To, for, for example, right now uh, in parental RCU, uh, RCU relock and RCU unlock involve a real function call. Uh, there's really a call involved. Whereas in non parental RCU, it's, it's, it's an inline function. Uh, static inline function, so uh, there's no function call instruction. Uh, Lai Zhangshan, some years ago, uh, gave some patches, a patch series that got it to where on x86, it could be a um, also an inline function. The, the reason that it's hard to make it an inline function right now is that it access the accesses a field in the task structure. And the task structure uh, isn't available everywhere. And if you try to make it available everywhere, you end up with all sorts of problems with in, include file uh, cycles and, and issues. Uh, what uh, uh, what Lai Zhangshan did was uh, uh, kind of a clever trick involving making it so that uh, 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 it didn't have to live in the task structure. But that also had the effect of having some more stuff happening on context switch. So at some point, I need to take the scheduling guys aside and say, yeah, come on. Uh, uh, you know, I haven't heard complaints, uh, specific complaints about people, um, aside from Lai Zhangshan sending me the patch, 
uh, saying they're running into problems with uh, overhead on that side. I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic because, I mean, you got an extra function call. That can't be free. Uh, Linus one time complained about it, but it turned out that that was a problem with his measurement. And he, so he retracted the bug report uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, but uh, at this point, uh, there is an overhead. Uh, one of the things I've been toying with for a long time, um, in fact, there was a patch. Uh, I might have been submitted. I can't remember who submitted. It might have been me, uh, where I just we just uh, had a build step that uh, calculated the offset in the task structure and made that available uh, elsewise. And people got rather upset with that uh, with that trickery. But uh, that would have the nice effect of not requiring the schedule to do anything extra and allowing us to have inline uh, uh, functions. So. Uh, that's a couple of examples. There are a lot of things like that. Uh, let's see if I, well, let me let me just uh, take a quick look here. Uh, see if there's anything anything of uh, interest on my list. Um, let's see here. Uh, Lock torture could use some help. Uh, there's some a uh, bunch of things on KV free that uh, that Vlad is working on. Uh, uh, Miraj and I have been have been going through uh, task trace RC, which is fairly new. Uh, he found uh, he found some bugs and, and provided some fixes as as did I. So that should make that better. That's just debugging though. Um, one question I have for you guys: There's this thing called config from fast no hertz. All the places I know of where people use it, it's useless. Okay, what? So what's config net fast no hertz? What it is 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 a thing that allows you to um, Enter idle more quickly, okay. Uh, and uh, but and so embedded people uh, have liked it and used it, except that all the embedded people I know that use it right now also offload all their callbacks. Well, if your callbacks are all offloaded, FastNoHertz is doing nothing for you. It's adding overhead to the idle transition. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's adding a check. Hey, am I offloaded? Yep, I am. Okay, don't do anything. Uh, so from what I know right now, I should remove uh, config RCU fast no hertz. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna type that because I think that's important. Um, and one of the I've had on my list for a while, and I just haven't gotten to it. I'm gonna submit a patch that removes it, and if nobody complains, it's gone. Uh, so far, all the people that I've know have been using it have been using it in a way that isn't useful. So that's that's one. Uh, so thank you. That that was something I should have mentioned to begin with, just because I'm curious. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, one uh, one possibility that's been batted back and forth. I don't know if we'll do it. Right now, uh, I mentioned that RCU can remotely sense whether a CPU is idle. A CPU can be idle from an RCU pers perspective in two ways. It can be in the idle loop, deep in the idle loop, with Peter's changes of a year or so ago, or it can be in no hertz full user space mode. In other words, there's only one task, it's in user mode, nothing else is happening on that CPU, and so there's no RCU happening either, and we don't want to interrupt the CPU. Uh, and right now, there's those look the same from RCU's viewpoint. Uh, should they look different? And there's some possibility that some parts of the kernel could use an indication uh, of whether you're in no hertz full in one uh, user space in one on the one hand, or deep in the idle loop in the other. So that's another possibility. Uh, there's, uh, as I said, a bunch of testing things. Uh, there's one of the things that I've been working on for a while, uh, and I've made some progress, but more is needed, and that's dealing with cases where uh, callbacks are flooded. Uh, oh, and uh, to Shaquille's answer, it's uh, uh, RCU fast no hertz, but you need config in front of it. Uh, config won't fit, so there you are. Uh, but yes, please check. You know, uh, if somebody's using it and they need it, I shouldn't remove it. But if nobody's using it, let's make it simpler, right? Anyway, uh, there's some really simple ways you can flood callbacks. One is just have a loop in user space where you open a file and close it immediately in a tight loop. Uh, and every pass of the loop generates an RCU callback. You can generate a rather large number of them. Uh, and RCU can keep up with that. But uh, there's a possibility of other things. Now, uh, if you do that inside the kernel, I'm going to tell you not to do it. 
but user space does what user space does. And if you're doing it in the kernel, come on, put a, uh, a uh, con resket or something in that loop so that we have a chance, thank you. So that's that's a few things. Um, if uh, if you're interested, I could I can uh, uh, make a, a more complete list. And a lot of it's speculative. You know, I, I get an idea, I write it down, and it may be maybe that I just never do it. It may be that it's suddenly becomes really important and I do it, or uh, I may do it because I'm because I think it's cool or something. I don't know. I try. I'm less inclined to, to use the last reason that I get older for some reason. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Kumar, what do you think of the new user interrupts in XA6? Send you, you send you send you IPI in the context of signal M barrier based uh, URC flavors. You know that's really a question for Matthew, and he's on this call, so if he's up for it, I'd ask him to answer. Matthew, you you willing to take that on? Uh, can you just restate the question? Which one is it? Uh, the question is, what do you think of the new user interrupts in X86? Send you IPI in the context of signal mem barrier based URCU flavors? Uh, I'd, ha I'd have to look uh, more in details into it to have an informed opinion. Okay, uh, same here. Uh, but uh, 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 Kumar, could you send uh, uh, Matthew and myself an email uh, pointing us, uh, describing what you think, how you think it might be useful? Uh, and the question, uh, Shaquille, is it's uh, Kumar Kart uh, Kartikeya uh, Duvidi, whose name I probably just mangled, uh, the, the green K. Uh, well, maybe different colors to different people. Uh, the guy that just, just said sure down here. Uh, thank you, Kumar. I look forward to the email. Uh, and that's where the question is. Okay, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. And uh, we see on Matthew responding, uh, saying it's recently improved. So if you do a test, if somebody does a test comparing things, please make sure you talk to Matthew and make sure you're getting the, the latest and greatest stuff. Um, you know, rather than just grabbing whatever your distro might happen to have, which could be quite old. Uh, Matthew also noted that there's a C API, but it can use C++ and that's great. Uh, the difference of what Folly is is actually integrated in C++, so it knows about templates. So you can, uh, so instead of just having a, so instead of having an RCU struct you put in your structure, you inherit from, uh, I can't remember the name in Folly library and the C standard is RCU obj base. Um, why that makes a difference is an interesting question, but, but there you have it. Okay, Matthew asks about an extension, uh, RCU lock, kmalloc, GPF kernel, if uh, RSU needs to require a lock. Okay, um, well, if you, okay, so if you, if you do, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying there, Matthew. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you very literally, initially, and then tell me where I went wrong. If you do RSU read lock, then kmalloc had better say GPF atomic, because we don't, we don't block. So um, right. help so, me out. So, so, so what, what I'm asking for here is the ability to automatically drop the RCU read lock. So I, it wouldn't you, you wouldn't want to just call RCU read lock. You'd want to call RCU read lock auto drop is okay. Um, and then generally when you call kmalloc, you don't need to drop the lock. Um, but we, we, we do all these games right now where, where, where we either allocate memory up front when we won't necessarily need to, to actually use it or we use GFP atomic when actually it'd be fine to sleep but we don't have the we don't want to write the code to uh yeah it's it's it's, it's awkward right um so I want to say it's okay to automatically drop the RCU read lock, I will check before I do anything else that was being protected by the RCU read lock. Hmm. Okay, so um, I'm a little concerned about this because I see it as a potential way of generating all sorts of bugs. Um, is uh, So I think there'd have to be a lot of work on how to make something that uh, that would be safe. In this case, I'll throw out a possibility that I don't like, but uh, maybe it'll. I mean, well, well, first off, I'll start off with one I do like, which is okay, we'll uh, explicitly get out of the read side critical section when calling came out, let me back in, and then know when you're designed that that's what you're doing. Um, 
the thing I'm concerned about is that some guy uh, does a retry critical section, calls something that does this, where he needs the and he needs the critical section to extend over there, and he he uh, passed the wrong GPF flags. I want him to yell that, right? And he probably does too, right? I mean, it's a lot better getting. Uh, I mean, it's really irritating getting uh, locked up complaints out of RCU, but it's, in my opinion, a lot more irritating to have a really weird RCU bug where your stuff's getting freed out from under you. Um, so how can we? Um, okay, so what you said was you wanted an RCU lock. Um, we can drop out momentarily. Uh, the thing I'm concerned about is that you usually, in that case, would have specific areas where it was okay to drop out. Um, and then how do you tell whether you're in one of those areas? Uh, the way I like is to say RC read unlock. RC read unlock is pretty cheap, and so is RC read lock. Uh, they're they're, they're um, in, especially in uh, non preemptible kernels, they're, um, you know, they don't admit instru instructions. I mean, they constrain the compiler uh, thanks to device drivers and page faults. But uh, they're pretty cheap, so why not just get out and come back in? Yeah, unconditionally. We got a five-minute warning because we got some other people coming up. Uh, so why don't we? Why don't we? Uh, uh, I think what we need, Matthew, is more than we're going to be able to discuss in five minutes. I, yeah, I think right. we, I, I think we need to discuss and look at an actual use case and see what what works best in that case. I, I'll I'll tell you I'm skeptical, but you know I've been skeptical. I was skeptical of SRCU to start with too. So who knows, right? All yeah. right, uh, let's see. Um, uh, uh, Goren uh, is RCU torture testing CPU memory consistency enough for RCU RTL back black box testing. What's the suggestion on memory consisting by Linux test? Kate Litmus, lock, RCU torture, lock torture. Huh. Um, so let me restate what I think the question is. I think what you're asking is, hey, I'm making a new CPU. Um, what do I do to make sure that I've got, the, that I don't have hardware errors in the memory ordering? Is that is that fair or am I on the wrong track? Yeah, the, yeah, that's, a, that's a, that's what I asked, and uh, I want to, uh, you you know the uh, the CPU RTL design. They will have a DV uh, design progress and uh, uh, just uh, uh, proved by the RTL code by the hardware engineer by themselves. But uh, when they uh, integrate the whole CPU to us, we will test, and uh, firstly we will check the. Uh, the memory consistency is right or not, and the second we will to check uh, check that the stable uh, or, or or one uh, 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 strong a uh, uh, high pressure uh, on the CPU running uh, for some lockless and uh, and a lot of acquire release uh, spin lock uh, gathering together and. Uh, I'm able to see the CPU would uh, cause some problem or not. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, you mentioned K-Litmus and uh, Bouchon uh, seconded that. Uh, however, to your point you raised about a uh, uh, high load, I suggest you run K-Litmus with a heavy background load as well. Okay. So K-Litmus, um, K-Litmus is a facility uh, and Litmus, just straight Litmus, uh, K-Litmus, creates kernel modules which run in kernel space. Uh, there's also Litmus 7 in the herd tools toolbox. Um, and I'll type that. Yeah, yeah I know. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah I know K-Litmus. Litmus just- uh, No, uh, but not K-Litmus, but also just Litmus by itself. Okay. Yeah. And uh, 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 we've got a three minute warning. Thank you, James. Uh, and uh, the thing you have to worry about is uh, making sure that you have the right set of litmus tests. Um, what I, I, I know some people that do this, they may or may not will, be willing to talk to you. What I can do, send me an email and I will contact them uh, and also tell me if you can, what CPU you're working on, that may make a difference. And I'll contact them and see if they're willing to talk to you. I can't make any promises, but I can I can promise to I can promise to reach out to people who do that and have done that for years, using using tools like Litmus, okay? And uh, perhaps that'll help. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, okay. If that I, I works guess... for you, send send me an email. 
Okay. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Main problem: URCU applications are not making progress. Uh, yeah, Demetria, that is a problem, uh, and there, and that's the reason there's multiple flavors of user space RCU. Uh, and fortunately, there's been some uh, uh, progress that Matthew would be better able to talk to, but we don't have time. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, makes that less of a problem. Um, and then. Uh, uh, Cloudy, you've got a good question. I, I do not have time to answer it. I'm sorry. Send me an email and we'll go from there. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I can't talk about non-determinism in one minute. <laughs> uh, so with that, I think we're good, done here. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions and comments. Uh, and so I've had several people to get back to me. Um, and uh, let's uh, keep the contact, conversation going via email and other things. Thank you all very much and have a great rest of the conference. And thank you, James. <laughs>